So in this video, I'm gonna walk through a typical day in the life of a human being eating food. And I'm gonna explain why the typical way that most people eat can completely restrict their ability to lose any type of fat whatsoever. And this has been a really big piece of information when I'm helping clients lose over 230 pounds in a single year. So you're not gonna to wanna to miss this. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. Now what's really important to understand is that what I'm going to explain here is really not the only reason that a person might not be able to lose weight. If you've read any of my books or taken my courses or have been watching this channel for a while, you probably already know the things I'm going to go over in this video. You might learn more from checking out our video on 15 reasons you can't lose weight. And that talks into a, a lot more of the in-depth issues that someone might be dealing with that have the ability to restrict weight loss. But what I want to do in this video is just go through the day of a typical person trying to lose weight following mainstream advice. And we're going to look at Phyllis. I like to use Phyllis when I go through this example because there's not a whole lot of Phyllises around. If your name is Phyllis, I want to hear about it in the comments so I know there's more Phyllises. Is it Phyllises? Phyllis I? Oh, that doesn't sound right. So what we'll do here is we're just going to look at the fact that what people do when they're trying to lose weight it really doesn't work that well and you're going to understand why here. So let's just look in the day in the life of Phyllis where she wakes up and maybe she has her first meal at 8 a.m. Okay, so she's going to have oatmeal, an English muffin with jam, and some orange juice. These are all low fat kind of options, but they also have 73 grams of carbohydrates. That's a whole lot. So she's going to create a huge spike in her blood sugar, which is this blue number. Now keep in mind that I'm not using actual blood glucose numbers on this graph. I'm just using generalizations like her blood sugar is going to hit an 8 out of 10 kind of a thing. So let's just look at the fact that when she eats a meal like this, she's going to see a large spike in her blood sugar. And this green line is the insulin level that's going to follow right behind that. So when blood sugar comes up, insulin is going to come up as well. Now the problem is as long as insulin is high, Insulin is telling the body, hey, there's plenty of blood sugar. Let's use this for fuel. Let's not burn stored fat for fuel. And as a matter of fact, we may as well store more fuel as fat. Since insulin is so high, obviously there's plenty of glucose. We'll use that. So the problem is that when we see this blood sugar go high, it's also going to come down. And we're going to see a crash come down, and it's going to happen pretty quickly. The problem is that insulin takes a lot longer to come down. This insulin is a much slower trajectory than we're seeing with the blood sugar. That's going to come down slower. The problem is we want to have our insulin in this low level. Down here is what we call the fat burning zone. When insulin is in this level, then the body can access stored fat and burn that for fuel. Hey, now my pants are getting looser. That makes me real happy. That's what we want. We want insulin in this zone. But you can see that she's going to get hungry again. So let's see what happens next. She's going to come over here and she's going to have a banana and some pomegranate juice for a snack because somebody told her that pomegranate juice has health benefits. The problem is it also has 59 grams of carbohydrates. Oops, that's going to create this other huge spike in blood sugar. And instead of insulin starting to come down, it never even goes down at all. It's going right back up and it's going to follow right where this blood sugar is going. Again, she's doing what people view as reasonable. I was doing fruit. Fruit is healthy. Come on. I was doing pomegranate juice. It's a fruit juice. The problem is with all the carbs, especially the liquid sugars in that fruit juice, is going to spike blood sugar even harder. So we get this big spike and insulin never comes down. Even though Phyllis has no sight of this fat burning zone anywhere near where she is. It's, it's not even close. Nah not happening. So when blood sugar comes down pretty quickly, then insulin is staying so high, we know the body doesn't have access to another fuel source. So she's going to need to eat another meal and it's probably going to be similar to what she had before. So hey, let's fill us. Let's have a turkey sandwich. Let's have brown rice. Brown rice is more healthy. And then let's have a fat-free mocha latte. Well, you got 130 grams of carbohydrates. So you can see that you got this huge spike and insulin was thinking about coming down a little bit. It was nowhere near the fat burning zone where the body could access another fuel source, but it was thinking about it. 
but I ain't thinking about it anymore. Now it's way up here. So with insulin this high, you can see that it doesn't matter the number of calories she consumed. It doesn't matter the number of calories that she's burning. This is blocking her body's ability to access stored fat and burn it for fuel. What will Phyllis do next? Let's see. So there's gonna be another meal and she's gonna try to lose weight here at dinner so she's just gonna have a small salad. I'll just have a salad and maybe I'll have some rice cakes with that. Well, that's 47 grams of carbs. She heard that rice cakes were a great way to lose weight because they don't have enough calories, but they're still gonna spike this blood sugar and keep insulin from coming down again. Then, well, I just had a small meal, so I'm gonna, I shouldn't eat a lot before bed, so that's gonna do it. That's gonna help me lose weight. So even though Phyllis had this low calorie meal that was fit for a bird and really sets her up for a weight loss, so to speak, you can see that her blood sugar is really going to be high up here because the low calorie food also had a lot of carbohydrates that's going to raise insulin again. And she ate such a small amount of food, well, you know, the blood sugar is going to start crashing again and she's going to say, hey, I need something else. I'll just have a bite of ice cream. Oops, I ate the whole tub. And that was 64 grams of carbs. Now up here, blood sugar is way up here with a huge spike with all that ice cream and insulin is going up so high at 10 p.m. that it's probably not going to make it down the whole night. It might stay high the whole night and keep her out of this fat burning zone all the time as she's sleeping. So what would happen if a person ate just a little bit differently? Let's see how we could do this so that we can access this fat burning zone and allow a person to lose a little bit of weight. So let's look at an alternative route that we could go. So for a first meal of the day, why don't we have a spinach omelet with butter and two turkey sausages, maybe a cup of tea, two grams of carbohydrates. So we see when this glucose will still come up because we're still consuming food, we still have some carbs, we still have protein that can turn into carbohydrates. We're gonna get a rise in blood sugar, but you can see that insulin when it comes up, it's not really going super high. It's not even going out of the fat burning zone. So when this fuel is burned up, she's in a zone where she can access stored fat and she can burn it for fuel. So she might not even need a snack, but just for the heck of it, let's just throw a snack in there, but let's do a little bit of a reasonable snack and let's just see what happens when a human being would have a reasonable snack. Okay, so let's just have some cottage cheese with some berries and that has 18 grams of carbohydrates. So that's gonna create a bit of a spike here and pull her out of this fat burning zone. But when she's out of this fat burning zone, you can see that she's not out for very long. The blood sugar comes down, and since insulin didn't have a huge spike, it comes back down in a reasonable amount of time, and before lunch, she's already into her fat burning zone again. So let's have some lunch now. Let's look at what Phyllis might have. Let's have a chicken Caesar salad without the croutons. That's only three grams of carbohydrates. That's a minimal rise in blood glucose and a minimal rise in insulin. Still not out of the fat burning zone. So let's see, she might not be hungry, might not even need a snack, but if we do a reasonable snack of maybe just a protein shake with some raw almonds, that's six grams of carbohydrates. Again, just a minimal rise in glucose, a minimal rise in insulin, yet she's giving her body fuel and she can make it through the day okay. Then let's get to dinner and we see some lamb chops with broccolini. Lamb is delicious. That's only five grams of carbohydrates, a minimal rise, and always staying in this fat burning zone pretty much the whole day. She did have that one spot where she came up, but you can see that this spike here is nothing like here, and she never even got out of the fat burning zone. This is how you eat in a way that keeps this blood sugar on an even keel, keeps insulin low enough so the body can access stored fat, and then the person has a backup fuel source all day long. When we're looking at this fat burning zone and the ability to stay in there, Let's look at the difference between these two. You can see how drastically different this was, and this person is staying in the fat burning zone most of the day. So those are some really simple steps to at least give a person a chance at losing weight, to allow the body to access stored fat and burn that for fuel. Now there are things that can make lowering carbs that much very difficult for some people. There could be malfunctions and imbalances in the body. They'll make it very hard for them to lower their carbs that much. 
They might not be able to break down those proteins or fats correctly. So what I want you to do right now is jump into our other video that shows 15 reasons that a person can't lose weight. And that'll walk you through different things that could be going wrong that could make it hard to achieve this goal and could also have other issues that are restricting weight loss. So jump over right now and check out 15 reasons why you can't lose weight and dig in to see if there's other issues that are creating problems for you. I can't wait to hear about your results.